I'll hand you over to Sarah, um, the expert, um, to introduce herself um, and take you through the session. Hi guys, um, I'm Sarah, I'm a registered and sports nutritionist um, and I've been invited along today to do um, a British Heart Foundation recipe with you guys as a little cook along and then I've got some questions, already got some pre-questions to answer which I'll do as we go along um, and then please feel free to um, unmute yourselves and ask questions and we can be made this as interactive um, as you want it to be. So any questions just fire them along so you're not just basically watching me chop <laughs> and cook the whole time and I'm really happy to take any nutrition questions um, as we go along and I'll answer the five pre-questions that I've had as well. Um, so I think there's a shopping list, is there, is there on there? Perfect. So this should hopefully be quite a straightforward recipe. Um, I've chosen this one today because it's, again, a British Heart Foundation recipe. It's not one of mine, but it has like six different vegetables in it, with chickpeas, tomatoes, pepper, onion, aubergine, and spinach. Um, you need your olive oil, you need some curry powder, um, and then some pepper chili if you want that as well. And then if you want to keep it vegan, then avoid the creme fraiche, but if you want to add the creme fraiche, you can do that at the end. So I'll just give you a second to make sure you've got everything off the shopping list. And then we can begin to chop. Wow, I'm going to take the silence as a good thing. I'm going to try and change my screen so that I can see you all with your cameras on because I love this. <laughs> this is amazing. I love being able to see what people are up to. So, oh, fabulous. This has done it for me. Amazing. So we're going to start by just putting a little bit of olive oil in our pan and just getting that nice and hot, ready for when we've chopped the veg and to add that to the pan. So um, I'm going to keep dashing backwards and forwards, but you want to just turn your... Um, stove on to like a medium heat and add um, two tablespoons or two teaspoons of any olive oil, rapeseed oil, whatever you have, um, and we can get that nice and warm. Now the reason that the British Heart Foundation always mention rapeseed oil in their recipes is because it's one of the um, only oils that's actually really low in saturated fat, and saturated fat is one of the things that we should be avoiding to have a nice healthy heart. So. That's the reason why they mention it and put it in there. But olive oil is just as good. Um, they won't use coconut oil in their recipes because that's the highest saturated fat um, of oil that there is. Um, so when you've got that on the medium heat and it's going to gently warm behind us, listen out for any spitting or anything if it's getting too hot, we're going to start by chopping our veg. So we'll start with the pepper. Um, if you've already chopped, then I apologise and ask questions if you've already, you already chopped. Um, but I'm going to get going with the red pepper. So, with this recipe, like I said, I've chosen because it's got quite a, a few different vegetables in it. Um, but actually, one of the questions that we got through um, as a pre question was about people doing Veganuary, and I know it's been really popular this year. I keep just every year, it just gets, keeps getting bigger and bigger. So if you ask somebody that's doing Veganuary and the question that we got through was um, that they're really not getting enough protein. In the UK, we're actually really lucky in the fact that we're highly ever deficient in protein and that goes for veggies and vegans as well. But there's some really clever ways that you can mix your food together when you're doing Veganuary to make sure that you are getting adequate protein amounts. So basically when it comes to protein, it's made up of amino acids and when you have meat, they have all the essential amino acids. So then when you cut that food group out, like meat and dairy, you need to then turn to plant-based sources. And plant-based sources of protein don't always have all of that, all of those essential amino acids. So I can hear my oil. <laughs> about that noise up there. Just watch that oil for burning and don't that. So turn it lower if you need to. Um, so the plant-based sources of protein don't always have all the essential amino acids. And actually, there's only a few that contain all of the amino acids, and that's things like soya and hemp and quinoa. So they're the only ones really that are quite available in the UK market that have all of this, the same component as protein as what meat does. If you're not a fan of those, then other plant-based sources of protein include things like chickpeas, which we've got in this recipe, um, pulses, lentils, but they won't contain all of the amino acids. So 
what you need to do is a really clever cool in the cooking, I think that's why I say I've chose this one today, where we can mix a whole range of foods together. So the more variety you have in a plant-based diet, the more likely you are to get all of those essential amino acids. Um, so hopefully <laughs> that makes um, a bit of sense. But like I say, if anything doesn't make sense, please jump on, unmute yourselves. Be nice to hear some voices. I move on to the onion. I'm obviously a little bit slow at chopping and, uh, chopping and talking. Um, we've had a question through. So um, yeah. they've asked, because we're not getting a lot of sunshine this year, not going on holiday, are there yes. any foods we can eat to boost? Is it vitamin D they've asked? Yeah, so the, actually in the UK we are, because of the lovely weather, we are told to supplement um, vitamin D throughout the year, especially between October and April. Um, I'm just going to add my onion and peppers to the pan now, by the way, um, so that that oil's not burning too much. So feel free to join me if you haven't already. Um, but you can get it from foods, you can get vitamin D from foods, it's just, it's not that bioavailable in a lot of foods, so um, you can get it in things like mushrooms and some, some fish has vitamin D in as well, but it's basically the biggest range of, of it is from the sun, as like you've just mentioned, and that's because actually vitamin D is, it's called a vitamin, but it's actually um, a hormone. So when we go out in the sun, basically the vitamin D hits our skin and then it gets absorbed by the tissues and the blood and everything into our system. And that's the best way that we can get vitamin D. So when we do have these foods that contain it, like eggs and fish and mushrooms, that are uh, breakfast cereals as well, and breads can be fortified with it. Um, it's a good enough amount, but to have that every day, because it's something that we can't make ourselves or we can't hold on to, like other vitamins, it is better to just supplement it, especially, like I said, from October to April. Um, but that's a really great question, because when I work with clients, um, a lot of them are, just don't know what vitamin D is, so the fact that that's even a question, it's amazing, because it's, it's one of them nutrients where everyone talks about vitamin C, but vitamin D is so crucial as well. Um, so I'm just chopping that aubergine, so I like to cut it in half, and then do it like, like long ways first, and then cut it into like squares like this on one half, because they're not the easiest to cut. Um, An aubergine is actually a really great plant-based fibre source, so it's so underrated, and if you're like me and hate peeling vegetables, then <laughs> if you leave the skin on vegetables, it actually contains most of the fiber. So fiber, again, is something that we need to have a healthy heart, a healthy gut, a healthy diet. Um, so with the more we have of this, the better, basically. We should be aiming for around 30 grams a day, but in the UK, we tend to get around 18 grams a day. So by just leaving your, your skin, your skin on your vegetables, it's a really quick way of getting more fibre into your diet. And it'll save you so much time on a Sunday as well if you're doing a Sunday roast. <laughs> it's like my saviour, it's like not peeling vegetables or potatoes. Sarah? Hi. Uh, would you mind um, going through the butternut squash stuff as well? We don't really like aubergine. Okay, so. yeah, so with the butternut squash, um, how is it now? Is it literally just a full butternut squash? No, no, we've, we've done some dicing, we've got like little... little oh, amazing. Plants. So what I would recommend is you can either get another pan and start just boiling it or steaming it now, or you can add it to your curry, but you might just need to add more stock because it's going to absorb a lot more water than what an aubergine would. So if you uh, want we've it got, to be we've got plenty a little bit of we've got like 20 cubes, so we're fine. <laughs> If you want it to be a little bit al dente, then add it to the curry, but if you like it the soft, a bit softer, then maybe just grab another pan. Oh, okay. <laughs> Perfect. So just keep giving your vegetables a stir. I'm going to add my aubergine now. Don't worry too much if you're adding butternut squash. Sorry, I completely forgot to go over that. Um, but don't worry if you are, because the thing with this curry is it simmers for quite a while, so you can just keep, you can add things whenever you need to and just let it simmer that little bit longer if, it need, if you do need it to. So the aubergine is going in. When you've got your um, onion, aubergine and red pepper, if you're going to add chilli, um, I'm not going to add it in today, I'm <laughs> a little bit of a wimp, um, then add your chilli in as well. Um, and then just we're going to want this to go on a little bit of a higher heat now because there's more things in the pan. 
um, and we're going to try and cook this around six minutes. Um, so I won't stand at the pan all the time. Yours is probably going to look a lot better than mine because you're probably more focused and probably watching over your pan. Um, but is there any other questions, Izzy, or shall I start going through some of the, the ones that you sent over? Well, we've not had any yet, um, but I'll let you know if any come in. Yeah, so I can go over um, some of the ones that you, you sent over, some pre-questions. So we've spoke about Veganuary. If you've got any other questions on Veganuary, it's literally all I've spoke to people about this month. So please ask away when you need to. Um, one that question that do, do, does come up quite a lot, and actually it's been coming up obviously since March because of COVID and this pandemic. Um, but foods to boost our immune system. So that was a pre-question, but actually it's quite a good topic to cover because like Izzy mentioned about vitamin D, like it is something that we really need to be focusing on, not just in a pandemic, but in our day-to-day -day life. So when I work with clients, I really like to focus on long-term health rather than just those quick fixes because sometimes those quick fixes look great, but they're not doing you inside much good. And also, that long-term health is something that you're going to have forever. So if you're speaking to a nutritionist about it, you want to be able to take away certain tools to go and be able to implement that into your day-to-day -day life for as long as you can. So when it comes to boosting our immune system through food, unfortunately, it's not as easy as just eating a superfood and all of a sudden we've got this really great immune system. It's a really complex network of cells and compound chemicals. So it's it's not, like I say, it's not as straightforward and it sounds so boring, but actually having a balanced diet that's full of like plant-based foods, obviously meat is perfectly okay if you are a meat eater, like, you know, there's some really great uh, vitamins and minerals from meat that you can't get from plant-based meat, uh, plant-based foods. Um, the healthy balanced diet is probably the easiest way to have a strong immune system. I'm going to talk about some of the vitamins and minerals that help with it as well. So rather than boosting your immune system, which you probably don't want to do because you'll spend like your imbalances and everything going crazy, you want to really support your immune system. So that can be through nutrients like vitamin A, which is found in like green leafy vegetables like spinach. I try to relate everything to what we're eating today. That might be quite good. Um, and then things like eggs and fish. Um, you've got vitamin 6 and vitamin 12, B12, which are found in poultry and fish. Um, and these are really great because they actually help produce the new immune cells. So when you're, you get poorly and obviously it's attacking your immune cells and your immune system, then by having this healthy balanced diet and having these vitamins and minerals, it's helping you, it's supporting your immune system by helping you build new cells. You've got vitamin C, which is an immune cell that attacks those pathogens that are trying to attack you. So it helps defend your immune system a little bit more. And then you have things like vitamin D. So I wanted to mention vitamin D because during the pandemic, it's kind of got um, some well-deserved recognition of vitamin D. It's a very underrated vitamin. However, it shows, it's not shown to help boost your immune system. It's actually, if your vitamin D status is quite low, it's linked to having a really weak response to pathogens and those attacks and those viruses. So it's just getting that whole rounded approach with your diet and getting these vegetables, these um, plant-based sources of protein, these fruits into your, um, into your diet that contain these vitamins and minerals and these antioxidants. That's really going to help you support your immune system, but also have a healthy heart, have a, like, a really nice functioning gut, which is really important. Um, and then it, everything else will come hand in hand with that. Um, it sounds so boring, like the balance balanced um, variety message sounds so boring but honestly like it's there for a reason so there's not one food that's going to help for your immune system but getting those like vitamin a vitamin b uh, 6 b12 vitamin c getting that range of things into your diet is really going to help uh, and it's easy to do like it's not you don't have to spend like 20 pounds on like some green powder do you know it's it's like 90 people have had the spinach and like 30 people's chopped tomatoes do you know it's some really cheap things that you can use doesn't have to be like really glamorous um, superfood products. So how's everyone's veg looking? Is it starting to soften a little bit? Um, we've got another question in which might um, relate to that topic. So this one says, I've got a very big sweet tooth. What are some healthy options that are good for me um, instead of sugar? <laughs> 
Well, you're not on your own because that is probably my most asked question this month, to be fair. So you're definitely not the only one for the sweet teas. Um, I mean, if you've got that sweet tooth, then of course, like feed it. You know, there's every food in, in moderation, everything's there to be enjoyed. If it's becoming something that's kind of taking over and it's predominant sugar, it's predominantly that big thing in your diet, um, then making sure that you're having like your meals and your snacks evenly spaced out can help prevent like a rise and a peak in blood sugar, but also a drop in blood glucose as well, which makes you crave that sugar. So try and have like, um, your meals spaced out quite evenly to just prevent that of that rise and fall. Um, having foods that are like rich in fibre and fat have been shown to help carb, um, curb carbon sugar cravings. Um, and like your fibrous foods, like your whole range of whole fish, your beans, things like that, and then your fats are like nuts, avocados, oily fish. Um, and then it's been shown that just by basically taking away, like just say you have a chocolate bar every day and you're not happy with that and you don't want to have a chocolate bar every day well you want it but you, you, not, you might not feel like it's the best thing then just taking that chocolate bar away for one day that week will help with that long-term that long-term craving so rather than going cold turkey like with anything like with, if people do dry jam you'll probably know what i'm talking about when i'm saying about going cold turkey it's probably not something that's going to be a long-term thing so you want to slowly gradually take that sugar down um i'm going to add my curry powder now by the way guys um if anyone's ready you need three teaspoons of curry powder so mine's already measured out i'm going to put that in just for when your kitchen starts to smell amazing now just mix that in you're going to do that for about a minute Just keep an eye on how it's cooking. So if anything's browning off, just turn your heat down slight, just slightly because we're going to add the tomatoes and chickpeas in in a minute. So that's going to just need to go down into a medium heat. Um, but some really good alternatives for sugar snacks <laughs> are things like having like berries with things with something like a Greek yogurt because then you're having the, the sugar and the sweetness from the berries and the fruit, but also you've got the protein and the fat from the dairy that's going to again stop that blood sugar spike. Um, things like homemade stuff is really great and I mean you can control how much uh, sugar you put into things there. Um, you've got, I'm going to talk about like, the natural side of sugar, so like your apples, so you can get like apple, chop it up and dip it in nut butter, again teaming it with something like protein and fat to again stop that rise and then the thing is when you have that rise you either need to have more sugar to keep it <laughs> peaked up and then you're going to have a, a, you're going to fall straight back down. Um, or if you'd like to say when you team it with other foods, it'll just help that kind of stay really even straight. Um, am I going off course a little bit with that question? <laughs> I feel like I'm just like rambling on about sugar. Um, dark chocolate's really great because it's not as rich. So, you know, it's not as moorish as what a milk chocolate is. Um, but I think all sweet treats in moderation and try and get it from these natural sources. And like I say, the biggest tip is probably to have your meals and your snacks evenly spaced out to just stop that craving. Um, if the craving's getting out of control, then just, just have it. I mean, I'm not a massive fan of diet foods, um, but some people really rave about like the caramel flavored snacker jacks and things like that. Um, but that wouldn't really satisfy me. So I'm not a fan of, of that, that kind of thing, but it's, it's, it works for some people. So um, if you're now ready, if you've got, everyone's got the curry powder in, hopefully, um, it's probably been about a minute. So we're going to add the tomatoes and the chickpeas. So if you haven't already, um, drain your chickpeas. I've already done mine. Um, just drain them out. They should have water in the can. And then obviously you've got your chopped tomatoes. So I'll start adding mine in now. Watch the heat on the pan so it doesn't splash. I'm being really daring wearing white today. I don't know why I did that. Um, we've got another question when you're ready. Um, what type of foods is good for a picky teenager who doesn't like many fruits or vegetables to remain healthy? That's a very good question. So if you like things like curry, then like that's a really good way you can blend things in. And chopped tomatoes, are, if they like tomatoes, um, but things that, they're the kind of things that kids and teenagers tend to like a little bit more. Um, that counts as one of the five a day. 
if they're having breakfast cereal, make sure it's got the, the, it's fortified with these mineral um, different um, vitamins. So there'll be like B vitamins in there, there'll be vitamin D, um, there'll be iron fortified in it. So there's some really great ways of getting that in, just looking at fortified products. Um, like maybe like adding like shakes. So like it'd be like milkshakes, add a banana in there. Um, I've got I've done a recipe actually which has gone down pretty well with people and it's like it's mac and cheese so it's got the mac like it's got the pasta um, and it's got the cheese but I, I actually blended up cauliflower and put it in the sauce because cauliflower doesn't taste of anything so you could kind of do like a bit of hidden veg in there um, I work actually in the food industry quite like um, a lot and that's one of the biggest things that we get to do is hide vegetables and food and <laughs> you'll be surprised what, what's in there. Um, but just making sure they're having things. So like, if they like baked beans, then great. That's a really great source of fiber, protein, and it's one of the five a day. So it doesn't have to be fresh ingredients all of the time. Um, it can be things that have got like the one of the five a day on, which they might not realize. Like if they are really fussy, um, like spaghetti hoops by Heinz, like them kind of products, they're one of the five a day. So it's better than having nothing, basically. Um, like the 50-50 bread's really great way of sneaking some extra fiber in there. Um, I'm just trying to think. It's a good question. Leave it with me. I keep thinking about that as we as we go on. Um, I'm going to add my stock now. So you want 175 ml of stock. So you can go to the kettle, boil your kettle, um, or I've tried to do a little bit already. I just use a stock cube um, and then put 175 ml of um, boiling water in there, and then I'm going to add it to the pan, and then it's going to simmer for about 10 minutes. Um, if you're using something at squash and you can get a knife through it, then you can always drain that off and add that to the curry now as well. Um, but that's if it's like if it's boiled or softened really quick. And then when you have added your stock, just give it a nice mix around, making sure that there's nothing really that's burned or everything's like evenly covered. The stock might not cover the whole of the food, but we're going to keep stirring it as we go along. And then turn your heat down to it, again, if it's not already on to a medium heat. And then we've got 10 minutes of that simmering. And then we add the spinach. So it's a really simple dish, and it's something that's great because you can have it for dinner, and then you can have it for lunch the next day if there's anything left. Um, you can team it with rice, naan, do you know, you can stick team it with a lot of different things. You could even just make this a lot more watery and have it as like a chickpea curry soup. Do you know, you can, you can really do anything with something like this. You can add meat to it if you wanted to. Um, you can use like old veggies, but I think these that kind of dishes are really great for any veg that you've got that needs eating. Just shove it in something like this and it's a good way of using it before it goes out of date. So it can stop a little bit of food waste. Someone's asked, um, how would you freeze this to keep it? What would you do with it? Don't know <laughs> what they mean, but so I, I think they mean if meal prep. <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah, so if you're doing meal prep, um, it's going to simmer for 10 minutes now. You're going to put the spinach through um, and then I would take it off the heat and put it into um, a, like a big bowl to cool down. And then when it's cool, then you can portion it up and freeze it in like Tupperwares um, or whatever you've got lunch boxes. Um, and then if you're going to have it for lunch the next day, I'd um, take it out the night before and just let it be frosted in the fridge. Um, or if you're going to have it for your dinner, just take it out before work um, and just let it again defrost in the fridge. Because it's all plant-based ingredients, um, it freezes really, really well and it'll last a couple of months. So. Um, it's when you're not messing around with like meat and dairy, it's a lot easier to kind of meal prep this kind of thing. Um, if you are using creme fraiche today, only use that on what you're going to eat today because you don't want to be freezing this and messing around with stuff like that. It's just going to be a bit funky. We don't, we don't want that. Um, but yeah, the, things like these are really easy to freeze and so easy to cook. Like we're doing this in like less than an hour. They're like chopping and cooking and everything. So like I say, you can add and take away as much as you need to with ingredients that you like. Um, do you want me to talk, answer the question on dry skin in the winter? Yeah. So um, again, at, at the moment, I've got like really sharp lips. It's just it's that time of year where the weather's going to be really harsh on our skin. And um, 
I actually, the clinic that I practice out of um, is owned by an aesthetic nurse. So I get like quite good skin tips from her. And then I help her with like the food side of things. Um, and just like boosting your immune system, there's no miracle when it comes to like what foods are going to help or, you know, like collagen's going around at the moment, all of these kind of things. If you're having collagen supplements, but your diet is absolutely shocking and you're not looking after your skin, then it's, it's not going to do anything. You know, it's, everything needs to go hand in hand. Um, but there are some foods that contain these vitamin and minerals that can help um, kind of give you that healthy skin and hydrated skin. So basically, if your skin's hydrated, it's probably pretty healthy. Um, the tips that the aesthetic nurse gives me is to even these winter months, we kind of forget to wear SPF. Every time I go out, even like walking the dog now, I have SPF 50 on. That was like the biggest thing that she could tell me was to wear SPF 50. Um, so that's a really good one. Um, from the nutrition side, hydration is so important. And because we are getting more harsh weather and it, it is a lot harsher on our skin, when it comes to winter, we actually tend to not drink as much water anyway because there's not that thirst need from what you get when it's warm and it's a hot day. So making sure that you're hydrated is so underrated <laughs> because it's something that we all know we should do, but we really the struggle to do it. So like to just I do little tips and tricks. So like I'll have a glass next to my kettle so that when I get down, go downstairs in the morning, I fill that glass up with water while I put the kettle on and I drink my water before I, you know, there's little tips that you can have to keep you hydrated and that will not only have a big impact on your the way your brain functions that hydration is so important for the brain function especially when we're working from home um but again it's really important for the skin then there are like three of well there's four actually that I've, um, i wanted to mention that are really great for our skin is four vitamins so we've got selenium and um, this is found in things like fish and brazil nuts so if you're not a fish fan, um, you can get enough selenium a day by having like three Brazil nuts a day. So that's a really easy thing to be able to get into your diet. You can crush them and put them on curries like this, or you can just have them as a snack. Um, vitamin A is really great for our skin. So again, that's your eggs and your leafy veg. Vitamin C, we know that's like in our citrus fruits, our peppers and things like broccoli. Um, and you'll see that obviously, the reason why we're always saying about a balanced diet is because these have overlap with the immune system and they obviously overlap with like recovery and a lot of other things. Um, and then you've got vitamin E. So that's found in things like nuts, seeds, avocado. Um, that's really great for the skin. And you'll find vitamin E um, on a lot of skin products. So like on the bottles of skin products, like vitamin E mist and all of that kind of thing, which is great. But I really feel like when it comes to skin health, it, it really does come from the inside and it shows on the outside. So, you know, we can put as much on um, our faces and our hands as we want to. But if you're dehydrated and you're not having this range of all these um, antioxidants from your fruit and veg, um, then it might not show as much. Um, but yeah, my takeaway from that would be hydration. Um, getting the things in like your fruits, like your, your vitamin C, citrusy fruits, your vitamin E, nuts, seeds, selenium, again, nuts, um, and your leafy veg. So get vitamin A. So you could make that, in, you could get vitamin A's in uh, leafy veg and eggs. So you could have like eggs on toast with spinach and then you could have some tomatoes that have got vitamin C in um, and then sprinkle some seeds on top and then that's your vitamin A. So that's a really nice skin meal, I suppose we can call it. Um, and then like I say, from the, the nurse that I work with in the our clinic, she just raves about SPF. So I'll just share that knowledge. Factor 50, she shouts at me, but I don't like anything. <laughs> anything um, Oh, but that's a um, just a quick question on the dish. Um, if someone's eating it tonight, do they add the spinach now and the creme fraiche now, or do they do that later? You could add the spinach now if you wanted to, um, but I would add the creme fraiche just before you serve. Um, just it'll just taste fresher and it'll add that like um, that little bit of the freshness and that thing to it more than obviously stirring it in. If you wanted to be a creamy curry though. Um, like this, you could add like coconut milk to this to make it a bit creamier and um, you could add the creme fraiche now and then still top it with it after but I just think if you're going to have it tonight and it's just going to be made fresh today I would put the creme fraiche on this evening um, but spinach can go through today but that can go through now if you've got it out already that should be fine because you want it it's going to be wilted in the curry anyway so it shouldn't matter um, so what time have we got there's a couple more minutes for mine to simmer. Um, hopefully everyone's aubergine is starting to soften now. 
If you want to speed this up, you can cover it as well with a pan lid or tin foil um, if you wanted to do that, especially when we put the spinach on. Um, so yeah, hopefully that kind of answered the skin question. Um, someone also said about foods to help with sleep, so people get a little bit of insomnia, or I think now because we're like stuck in the same four walls a lot more than usual, people are starting to struggle with the sleep a little bit. Um, and sleep is very complex, like it can come from, it can be affected by many different ways uh, and many different things, but diet can actually be one of them. So um, someone's asked for the foods to eat or to avoid for better sleep. So I would say to avoid would be to, to avoid having something really high in fatty and sugary before bed, um, just because obviously we need our body to be digesting that and it's going to be very alert while it's digesting that quite rich food. So avoid that before bed. Um, make sure that you, you're sipping water with your meals in the evenings to just help that digestion a little bit, especially if you're having high fiber. Um, and then there's foods that can help with better sleep. It's been shown um, that if you have like a whole grain cracker with a little bit of cheese on top, so you've got basically cheese and crackers, <laughs> um, the carbohydrates and the protein from that, basically, when you can co-ingest carbs and protein, it sends a signal up to our brain and kind of it can relax us a little bit. So it can it can release a happy hormone called serotonin, and, and it also can release a hormone that just helps us relax that little bit more. So if you are struggling and you are, you do feel a bit peckish, then cheese and crackers. Um, but again, obviously not like loads of cheese and loads of crackers because <laughs> your body's going to be working it too hard to digest it rather than actually get the benefits of those foods. What about in the morning, Sarah? So to be like a little bit more energetic in the morning, because I'm really not a morning person and it takes me a while to like wake up. So I would say a glass of water. So literally kickstart that system by waking up with water, hydration. Because like breakfast, like fast, we're breaking that fast and you've been, your body's been working and repairing overnight and it needs that water because you've had like eight, nine hours without it. So, like I said before, like, I just have a glass ready in the kettle because <laughs> I love caffeine. So I'm literally like, no, I know that yeah, I'm um, important. Um, and then getting things in like your, your carbohydrates. So carbohydrates like um, like bananas are really great because it's a fast releasing um, glucose. So it goes straight into your system and it gives you a bit more of a, a bump of energy. If you need that energy to last you all morning, um, something like porridge with bananas, um, a really good milk, so it could be dairy milk or it could be soy milk to get those complete proteins in, um, and then make, maybe a little bit of nut butter. So you've got like all the food groups covered in one bowl, and then yeah. that will kind of um, give you the hit that you need from the carbohydrates. It will give you the protein that you need to be cell function, and then you've got the nut butter, you've got the fats that will just again will help you with your energy levels. So um, that is probably the most underrated breakfast ever, <laughs> like porridge, nut butter and banana or berries. Um, but it's, it's one of these like soup breakfasts for a reason. It's got all those food groups in. Um, but yeah, the water, obviously it sounds so basic, but if you don't do that already, it, will make a, it should make a difference. Right, um, and if you're not taking vitamin D, I mean, I can't, I'm not going to mess around with my camera, but I can't have next to my kettle. I have a vitamin D supplements as well <laughs> to remind me in the morning. So. You know, if you are a caffeine grabber like me, you just have those things that you know are going to set you up for the day. They're ready so that while the kettle's boiling, you can have your water, have your vitamin D supplement. Nice We've one. got another Cheers. question about breakfast. It says, on the topic of breakfast, is it bad not to eat breakfast if you aren't hungry? No, I think I'm just, by the way, guys, on a dish, I'm going to add the spinach now. So <laughs> if you've um, got your spinach, you want, I, I'm going to do about three handfuls so that you can never have enough. Um, so it's up to you how much spinach you use, but you want to just start gradually stirring it through, it wilts a little bit. If you do want to leave it until you eat this this evening, then that's, that's fine. Um, but for the sake of the recipe, I'm going to start mixing mine through now. Um, no, because it depends on the kind of person you are. So if you definitely don't feel like you're hungry for breakfast, then just focus on your hydration so you're at least getting something into your body to kind of like wake yourself, wake yourself up. Um, even if it's water and then coffee, do you know what you that's absolutely fine? Because in your coffee, if you have milk, then you've got a bit of protein and fat from the milk. Um, but yeah, it's not bad. It used to be really seen like used to, people used to try and force people to have breakfast. Like I know some dietitians that be like, no, they're not eating breakfast, they need to have it. 
and they make they used to make people feel sick to eat breakfast. I think everyone is so so unique when it comes to food, and everyone has so many different preferences that if you're not a breakfast person, don't feel like you've got to be. Just try and make sure that your snacks and your lunch and your dinner are making up for those nutrients that are missed at breakfast. Do you know? So if you don't really like breakfast and you it gets to like eleven a.m. and you're quite hungry but you don't want lunch. Just get a really good, just get a really good snack in there, like apple and nut butter or some yogurt and berries. It only has to be small. Um, so yeah, I think from my experience with when I've worked with people, more people don't like breakfast than you than you think. So as long as, like I say, you're getting those nutrients in in other meals and snacks, and for me, there's not there's not an issue with that. But don't forget about that that glass of water in the morning. <laughs> I feel like that's all I'm talking about. Um, but it's just it's so important. We've got one more question in when you're ready. Um, what do you think of taking a probiotic? Is it worthwhile? So this depends on why you're taking the probiotic, who's told you to take it, and what brand. <laughs> so there's, there's like three massive factors there which will play a part. Um, there's a really great dietitian called The Gut Health Doctor who is doing a lot of research at King's College about this. Um, and she Basically, there's with pre and probiotics, there's not there's not enough research, especially with probiotics at the moment, to kind of um, prescribe to the general public. And um, so it, you know, it might just be like a hospital setting where somebody has obviously had a lot of antibiotics and then they get told to have a probiotic. So it won't do you any harm, but it might be a lot of money spent on something where the evidence just isn't there yet. Like the gut health is such a new thing. Um, that they've only just kind of discovered in the last few years that you've got in your brain having axes and talk to each other. So the fact that now all these products are coming out just because gut health is trendy, um, the evidence is lacking slightly. But if you enjoy taking it, like I say, it won't do you any harm at all. Um, if you like to do a little bit of reading around nutrition, depending on what your brand is, I'm not going to name and shame brands um, because that's not fair. But just go onto the brand website and see what their study is like. It'll tell you about the study. Um, see how many people are in it. Do you know if it's, a, if it's a small study and that's what they're using all of their claims for. Might not be the best one to be going for. Um, but yeah, just like do a little bit of research. And if you've been prescribed it by a medical professional, then ignore me. Um, but if it is something that you're just kind of seeing and you want, you like the sound of it. Um, if you enjoy it and carry on, but it's it won't do you any harm, basically. Um, but it might have given all these healing powers that they claim. They've said, is it called Simprove? Uh, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but you on the on that website, if you go onto the Gut Health Doctor's Instagram, um, she's called Megan, she's really, really great and she will tell explain it a lot more a lot more better than I can do it now <laughs> without offending anybody um, but yeah she's a re she's really good when it comes to probiotics and kind of going through all the, the myths and the fads when it comes to that kind of thing um, and then I'll just answer this last question from the pre-questions so I don't want to miss anybody out and um, someone said like if they have high cholesterol what foods should they be looking at or cutting out etc um, Food swaps, so basically when you have high cholesterol, it can be between LDL and HDL, so I won't go into too much detail around that, but basically one of them, if you have high cholesterol, could be really negative on that, and that's things like saturated fat, so it's saturated fat, like your, your full fat dairy, your butter, your biscuits, your meat with all the, the fat still on it, um, like sausages, um, like, you know, all the things that people tend to really enjoy contain saturated fat. Um, and that's just something that you should be looking to reduce slightly. We shouldn't really be getting more than 20 to 30 grams. So it's 20, 20 grams for female and 30 grams for male of saturated fat from our diet per day. Um, so I'm not a fan of counting calories or anything, but them apps can be quite good to get in a round around, around about figure of where you actually are with your saturated fat. Um, but when it comes to unsaturated fat, that's okay to have. So um, your unsaturated fat, like these products or these foods that are known for being quite fatty, but they, they act differently in your body to what saturated fat does. So it's okay to have if you have high cholesterol. 
And that's things like your oily fish, like your sunflower, your rapeseed, your olive oil, which we spoke about at the beginning, um, your avocado, your nuts, um, and like I say, your yeah, avocado oil even. Um, and they have a bigger chain of unsaturated fats. So they're probably, if you like the kind of rich foods, they're something that I would prioritise more than like butter and um, coconut oil and things like that. Um, but again, with, with high cholesterol, a lot of things can be down to your lifestyle as well. You know, try not to look at what food you can't have, like maybe look at what food you can have. And you know, the Mediterranean diet is really great for heart health and high cholesterol. So um, that could be something that you maybe look into. And it's not a restrictive diet, it's just a more wholesome way of, of eating. Um, hopefully that everyone's curious me already. I'm just gonna check on mine. Um, my spinach is wilting now. I'm going to turn my heat off. If you want yours to um, simmer for a little bit longer, then please don't feel that you need to take your um, your curry off the heat just yet. You know, you, if you're at home, you've got time to keep it on for a little bit longer. Um, it won't do any harm. Um, but yeah, I think it should all be ready now. It's quarter two, so it's definitely been on the pan for long enough. I'll serve it in this dish. And I'll show you what mine looks like. If anyone's brave enough, to show me what that looks like, we have a look. I've really been neglecting mine, so I'm sure that will be awesome. Look a lot better than what mine does. It smells incredible, though. Okay. Again, if you want to keep this vegan, maybe use like um, a coconut milk, um, coconut yogurt or something, or soy yogurt. I bought like the crumb fresh that's um, like really light <laughs> and it's so thick, it's not very runny, so this might not look very nice on top. And then if you're having rice or naan or a wrap or anything with it, then you can serve it. But that is mine. I'll try and reach across. If anyone's willing to show me theirs, <laughs> then let me know. Sarah, will you take a picture of it um, before you start eating and send it across to us so you can get it on yeah. social media? And then say, yeah, of course, yeah, I will do, definitely. Nice one. Um, but yeah, so I hope that was quite straightforward and I feel like I've spoke for like the whole <laughs> yaps on for the whole time. But if you've got any more questions, um, like you've got me for a little bit longer, so please feel free to fire some more questions across. Or oh, while you're serving yours up, I can wait to have a quick sneaky peek. Um, actually, why do I just um, getting everything together? Obviously, this is in collaboration with the British Heart Foundation, um, and having a healthy heart is so important. Like we say, we talked about the immune system, but our heart really is the thing that keeps us going. So um, we really need to like in increase our fruit and veg. I know it sounds boring, but you know, like foods like this, these really hearty meals, especially on like a miserable day like today, these really hearty meals that you can just add as much veg as you want into it, um, are really great. You can do this, make it into a soup or do you know, you could do a pie and just add that, but get them hidden veggies in as much as you need to. Um, try and have less salt, like it's really common for us to just be adding salt to everything. Like we've used the stock cube today, um, but you can get lower sodium stock cubes. Um, try not to add salt to something that's already got salt in it. Like you don't need to boil potatoes or pasta with salt in the water. Like it's not necessary, there's already salt in the pasta. Um, Try, if you are a meat or a fish eater, try to have um, two portions of oily fish a week. So that's things like salmon and mackerel, that's really, really great for our heart health and can help with our memory, which I know if you like me, you might, I have the worst memory ever. Um, and I've mentioned fibre, but really trying to get our fibre from the average of 18 grams a day to 30 grams a day. And again, if you wanted to do a chicken curry, that could be easily increasing the fibre by just having a few chickpeas put in there as well. Or if you're having um, chilli and you're having mince or corn or whatever you want in your chilli, adding like five beans to it, you know, and having like five bean chilli, that just helps your, your fibre increase quite a lot. Um, and then of course, there's the things like increasing physical activity, so we all just use that as an excuse to get outside, 
while we, while we can. Um, you know, we're not travelling to work or working um, as much as we normally would do. Um, and then if you are willing to, um, decreasing our alcohol consumption really does help with heart health um, and smoking as well. So there's a lot of lifestyle factors. Um, food isn't everything, but these diet-related diseases like cholesterol and heart health, they can really, the food can really, really make an impact. It's not medicine, but it can make a really positive impact. I'll end it there. Has anyone got their dish to show us? Oh, I think Charlie has. Oh, let's see. We've not, yeah, we've not got the creme fraiche on yet, but... Oh. <laughs> oh. Don't Sorry. drop it, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> I've done mine, is he? So let's see. Right. Hang on, I'll try and... I don't know whether you'll be able to see it. Oh, that was good. How's the button at squash? Is it nice and soft? Uh, yeah, I think so, yeah. Amazing. I can't Don't see you. Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling, me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if everyone wants to submit a photo of their dish, um, we're running a bit of a competition, so the best looking one. Oh, Lois, that looks very good. I like your little pot. Oh, oh, how have you done that? Right, that that looks so mine. Oh, it looks like it's going to check out. It's quite runny. <laughs> They look really good. Well done, everyone. Yeah, so good. And like I said, if you have like the whole grains with it, that should absorb some of that running. A little bit runny. Um, it's nice. So that's amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you for joining, everyone. Um, and we hope you enjoy your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if anyone else has got theirs to show us, or if you just want to send a picture, that's fine. But no, thank you for joining. I hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, ad has got hers to show us now. Oh, nice. Looks good. Very good, Aidy. <laughs> well done. Oh, well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for joining us. Um, Hello, Sarah. Everyone say thank you in the chat. <laughs> thank you. And I feel, I feel really so better about the breakfast. I don't feel guilty anymore now. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> been dry, so never feel guilty. We don't want to eat at all. Um, well done, everyone, and go and enjoy your food. <laughs> <laughs> Have a nice week, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.